Oh, Lana Wood, can I say it is always great to see you. Thank you. It's always wonderful to be seen. Now, first up, my condolences regarding the recent passing of Ryan O'Neill. Of course, you two starred together on Peyton Place. You became great friends. In fact, you were lovers for a little while. So I guess his death was something that really hit you kind of hard. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, you know, we worked together for such a long time and dated briefly, but um, we working together with someone on a set, I mean, there is a closeness when, particularly when characters are supposed to be intertwined and you go through so much as a character that there is sort of a little bit of a wash over, you know. Did his death, Lana, come as a surprise or... Were you well aware that he'd had so many health problems in in the last decade or so? I wasn't terribly shocked because I know he had not been doing well. And he he lived a, a faster life than I did. It still hurts. And it's still another person that one cared about and was close to that's gone, just absolutely gone. And that's... Very frightening. You know, you think of Ryan O'Neill and you think of this man with incredible charisma and astonishing talent. But you know what? Privately, I mean, his life just seemed a roller coaster of dysfunction and heartbreak and drama. What was the Ryan O'Neill that you got to know like? Ryan was very concerned about how he came off in at parties and, you know, where where we wandered and photos and um, he was, he was very concerned with that. Um, I mean, he, he was nice enough. He was, he was kind, but he could also be cruel verbally, which I didn't care for. So you know, the relationship didn't, didn't last long. Let's go back to the beginning because your showbiz life is absolutely fascinating. You began your acting career in 1947. You were one year old and <laughs> it was in a movie called Driftwood with Ruth Warwick and Walter Brennan and it featured your sister Natalie. But as it turns out, your scene was cut. It was because evidently um, all I did was cry the entire time. So they ended up cutting me out which is fine, but that it shows you my mom found every opportunity to um, to put me in front of the camera as well as Natalie. Now, your mum, Maria, she was kind of framed as a pushy stage mother, but she was simply determined, I think, of being somebody who wanted to see both you and Natalie um, become stars. At times she's been villainized, but I must tell you, she thought she was doing the very best for her daughter. And then I suppose she went, oh, okay, that one's gone. Come here. But um, she never did it in a mean fashion. Um, she didn't receive a great deal of glory for herself, but she did know that Natalie would have a life that would be quite extraordinary. And that's what she wanted for her. So I mean, she wasn't all bad. I read somewhere that you really didn't enjoy that audition process, you know, and would rather at that point in time have remained just somebody going off to school and having fun with your friends at school and not being part of that kind of sideshow. I felt terrible. I felt like I was losing out on what all the other kids were doing. I never felt part of my class and a part with my friend group. Um, so I ran away from home. Uh, I made it all the way to Beverly Hills to Natalie's house. And um, so she, of course, took me in and said she would deal with, with our mother. <laughs> and um, I stayed with her for a couple of weeks. And then she told me that my mom had promised that she would not push me into anything anymore and that I could just go to school and, and sneak cigarettes in the girls' bathroom. Now, 1955, you're in a movie called One Desire with a great cast. There was Rock Hudson, there was Anne Baxter, Natalie, of course, your sister, and you were credited in that one as the little girl. So that must have been a bit of a, a relief not to hit the cutting room floor. You know, I was on the set because Natalie had to have my mom with her, 
and my mom had no place to put me. So I was uh, ushered along and, um, you know, then told you're, you're going to be an extra in this and you're going to do this and that and we'll put wardrobe on you. And uh, But I didn't think anything of it. You were 10, though, when the searches came along. You and Natalie were in the searches. You played the younger version of her. What are right. your memories of the late, great John Wayne? He was very nice to me. He would pass me a candy like he was doing something that he didn't want anybody to see. He would open this tin of uh, black currant pastilles and and say, take, take one, they're really good. <laughs> and then he would say, take another one. And I mean, he was he was very sweet to me. He was very nice. And of course, that was a movie directed by John Ford. But is this yes. true? He barely spoke to you. Is that right? Oh, he hated children. He absolutely <laughs> loathed them. He didn't speak to me at all. Um, one time during the scene where I'm at the graveyard at the headstone and the dog has followed me. I'm supposed to say, Chris, go back and try to shoo him in the direction. And he watched the first take and he watched the second take. And then he came up and he said, can't you bend at the waist? And I said, yes. <laughs> so then, of course, I couldn't, absolutely could not bend at the waist. I could, <laughs> I could lean a tiny bit because I was absolutely mortified. So, um, yeah, that was the only time he spoke to me. Now, on TV, you made such a big splash in Peyton Place, you know, one of the great series of the 60s with Mia Farrow and, of course, Ryan O'Neill. You played one of the most delicious characters on that show, <laughs> Sandy Weber, who was a vixen. She was bitchy. She was fabulous. I yep. bet those writers threw everything at Sandy and I'll <laughs> bet you loved every second of it. The writing was terrific. I mean, I loved how Sandy was written and um, I liked playing the character. I I found it very enjoyable. Great set. You know, everybody was very comfortable together. We were all buddies, um, except for Barbara Parkins, who hated me. But everybody else, me and I would have lunch together in the commissary and she lived on cottage cheese and spinach. But Barbara absolutely loathed me. She... She never had anything to do with me when I when I joined the show. Mm. Um, we would always be in the uh, makeup room at the same time, and I knew she wouldn't speak to me. So, of course, if it was a Monday, I would say, so, Barbara, what did you do over the weekend? Oh, you know what I did? And I would just speak to her. I would ask her all kinds of questions, tell her all kinds of things to make her absolutely insane as she sat getting her makeup. <laughs> Why was there that weird dynamic, do you suspect? I have no idea whatsoever. Um, and it's funny because many, many years later, we were at a an autograph show together at a Comic-Con. And we were seated at tables, probably four tables away from each other. And I thought, oh, that's so lovely. It brings me back to all the memories about Peyton Place and how lovely that was. And I, I don't know why Barbara was always so nasty to me, but I'm going to write her a little note. So I wrote her a note saying, if I had done something back then, um, I apologize for it because I, I know I was sort of, um, I don't know, high spirited. But anyway, I wrote her this letter. I said, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to spend a little time with you since we are here, um, you know, for the entire weekend. And um, she was handed the note and she glanced out and threw it away and never spoke to me. She, of course, has gone on, I think, to be a photographer these days and really has nothing to do with the acting biz. Look, you starred in another series of the 60s and one I know that was a fan fave. It did only last one season, but it certainly made a mark. The Long Hot Summer with Edmund O'Brien. We shot the pilot. Then ABC said, absolutely, we want, you know, 13 episodes deal. Get rolling on it. And they recast um, everyone eh, except me. It was really bizarre. So... 1971, and along comes a little movie called Diamonds Are Forever, which <laughs> turned out to be, I think, Sean Connery's last outing as 007. You, of course, Plenty O'Toole. Suddenly the world sat up and took notice of Lana Wood in her own uh, right. I was delighted when I got a role because I was such an Ian Fleming fan. 
And Sean, of course, I had remembered from Darby O'Gill and the Little Peas people. Oh. And I thought, well, there is the most gorgeous guy I've ever seen in my life. So this is all terrific. And uh, as it turns out, I had had dinner at his house when he was married to Diane. And um, we all got along very well. It was terrific. So I thought, yeah, I've got a friend on on the uh, on the cast. And uh, it was enjoyable. But I was I was very nervous. <laughs> Oh, I really was very exacting. I mean, you know, a James Bond movie is a big deal. I mean, a lot of pressure for you. Did you do a lot of your own stunts, Lana? I mean, that bit where, you know, you're thrown out of the window and you land in the pool. How in the heck did they do all of that? We were on a one, one, uh, first floor, one story. So I just, it was just a little plop onto a mattress and not yes. a big deal. Then um, we moved around. We took a very, very long break and they built a platform next to the pool that was a, a six foot platform. Um, and a stuntman stood on top of the platform and we had a little ladder that went up and I would go up to the platform and then he would get me on his shoulders and settle me and then literally push me by by the butt <laughs> so that I would fall properly into the pool. Uh, that was done a couple of times. And then the first the first time you see me falling was a mannequin. That was a, you know, a, a soft rubber doll of some sort. I don't know. But um, the rest of it was me. And then my poor death scene that was me and that was almost worse than falling as far as I had to fall to do the uh, the first one so it was um was not terrific but you got on very well with Sean Connery in fact you two yes. had a little romance what was the yes. Sean like that you got to know so well would you summarize him as funny was he engaging was he dashing was he charming how did you find him he was all of those things but at the time he was also sad and um, therefore, he was a little bit more introverted than I had remembered when we all had dinner at his house. He was very sweet. He was fun to be with. You wrote in, in one of your memoir just about how helpful he was to you when making Diamonds Are Forever. You know, I mean, when you're working with a big star like that, it can go one of several ways, can't it? But he mm -hmm. was very fostering of all that you did and made yep. sure that Plenty O'Toole just really sizzled the way that everybody wanted. And of course, the end result speaks mm -hmm. for itself. So how did you feel when that news came through that Sean Connery, I think at 90, had passed away in the Bahamas? Absolutely devastated. Um, didn't know what to say, what to do. It was really dreadful. I mean, we lost that person who was very special. And um, it really, it was really bad. I mean, I I cried for a couple of days. And, you know, and then, and then I just tried to not, not think about it and just think about all the really terrific stuff that he had done and what he left behind. So, but I, yeah, I was absolutely devastated. Now, for you, Lana, the 70s were a blur of guest starring in an array of the biggest top-rating TV series of the day. I remember you in an episode of Night Gallery, Rod Serling's fabulous uh, series. Uh, what was the great Rod Serling like? We never met. He never oh, came really? onto the set. So it was me and Cloris Leachman and uh, Broderick Crawford. It was just the three of us. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. I, I liked doing that one very much. How intriguing, though, that Rod Serling wasn't there because I know he introduced each episode, of course. Uh, yeah. You know, he was also one of the writers and the executive producer, mm -hmm. the creator of the show. I thought he might have been there somewhere. But anyway, more's the pity for you. You didn't get, get to meet the great man. I know. I know. Yeah, I would have loved. I would have loved it. I do have the uh, the poster from the painting that started the uh, the episode with me sort of all broken in bits lying against a wall and my arms missing and you see wires and things and it's a great poster. I love it. I've got it framed in the hallway.
Beretta is another series, of course, you start on uh, in a guest role with uh, Robert Blake. Boy, I, I guess when you were making that series, you probably had no idea of what would befall him down the line. No, I certainly didn't. Um, he was, that was a very interesting show to do because he approached me at the one time that I went to a party um, with at Q Hefner's. I stayed for a very short period of time, but I wandered out onto the patio with my boyfriend and Robert Blake came up and he said, I want you to do my show. Will you do my show? And I said, yeah, I imagine I would, I would love to do your show. And he said, well, I'm going to use you like nobody else has. So a little bit of time passed. And then finally I got a script and I was, um, a Salvation Army worker, uh, ah. close to being a nun. And they had me scrub faced, had not a stitch of makeup on. And they slicked my hair, departed it down the middle and slicked it back into this very tight sort of bun and put on a pair of Coke bottle bottom glasses on me, which <laughs> made it very, very difficult for me to see because I was looking through those glasses. But that was my character, and her name was Olive, and I loved Olive. Then, yeah. of course, you know, you did the rounds of Starskins, Hutch, there were Fantasy Island, there was Police Story. But here's one, and I'm wondering how many of your fans remember this. You're in an episode of a series called David Cassidy, Man Under Oh, Star, yes. Which was fascinating because this was after the Partridge family, and the mm -hmm. show was created around David Cassidy as kind of like an undercover Los Angeles cop. And you had right. quite the meaty role in that. What are your memories of David Cassidy, man undercover? He didn't sort of talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, he would do the scenes, not uh, not overly kind or anything i mean he wasn't he wasn't rude or mean or anything like that but he he was very much very much kept to himself completely completely but um it was an it was an interesting role and i i liked that episode very much um there was another police i used to do police story a lot because they loved me on that so they would bring me into something and then kill me and then, you know, the next season I'd be somebody else and then they'd kill me again. But uh, my one of my favorites, other than the Wild Wild West, which I love doing, love doing, love Bobby Conrad, love doing that. Um, but I, I did, what the heck was the name of that show? The episode was The Last Man in the World. I worked with Richard Dreyfuss, who played this little... I don't know what he was. He worked at the hotel where I was staying and I was using him until my boyfriend with, would arrive with what he had managed to steal as he was holding up whatever, a bank or something. And um, at the end, of course, he's shot and he's lying in the street and I've been arrested. And uh, Dennis Cole says to me, you know, I I think he's he's asking for you. Could you go over and just say a few words to him? Because he's he's not going to make it. They took me over to him, and I I leaned over, very softly said, "I wouldn't have gone with you if you were the last man on earth." And I straightened up and left. It was like the meanest character. I adored it. it Ah, it was terrific. Oh, Craig, wait, I just remembered. It was Felony Squad. Yep, Wonderful yep. series. It was, it was. Now, Lana, your sister Natalie, Natalie Wood, it's been 42 years since she left us. There are those who say in mysterious circumstances. I would love to believe, and it would be a great solace to me, if I thought it was an accident, it would be, mm -hmm. oh, thank, thank God nobody else was involved. The, the loss is horrendous, but it was an accident. I worked with the Los Angeles Detective Bureau. I, I, I worked with the current coroner. 
I got information from the two detectives. Um, I spoke to the guy that was on Baywatch that they called him to come to get Natalie. I, I, none of anything that I put in my book is conjecture or my feelings. It's what I was told in black and white by people there. Dennis, who is the captain, told me more than he wanted to and said there was even more, but what he told me was bad enough and I don't, don't really need to know anymore. Um, it's, I, you know, I know people have asked me several times, why did you wait so long? Why, you know, why did you never say anything about RJ Robert Wagner before? Because I wanted to believe he wasn't involved. His involvement, the fact that he was responsible is earth shattering to me. Um, it makes everything worse and 42 years or 52 or you know, whatever. It's so painful and it has colored my entire life. It has colored what I've done with my life. It has, it has affected my daughter's life whom I lost mm. four years ago. Um, it's affected my grandchildren. It's affected, I, it's turned everything upside down. It really has. And I'm sure it has affected Natasha and Courtney, Natalie's children as well. Um, it's, <laughs> it's horrendous. It's, it's something that I'll never forget. You've written several books on this most recently, Little Sister. It is brutally honest. It is so from the heart. I think people need to know you two were incredibly close. You were like wallpaper to a wall. You couldn't be much yeah. closer, could you? No, we could not. It was always me and Natalie. You know, my existence was ripped from me. And it, it'll just always be dreadful. Take me back to that moment, Lana, in 1981, when you first heard that shocking news that oh. your sister had drowned. And do you remember where you were, what you were doing? How did it play out? Absolutely. I remember every second. I remember that I had a very bad night sleeping, being able to sleep, and that my mother was also, uh, I had her over, um, she was also having a rough time. We ended up having tea in the middle of the night, sitting at a little table in in my uh, in my apartment. Um, I finally fell asleep at around five five thirty in the morning, right around there. I don't know the exact time, but it was about that. Fell asleep, and then my phone started ringing, and it was a a school friend of mine who had remained my friend since elementary school and uh, she said Lana Natalie drowned in Catalina and I said don't be silly of course denial and I literally said a few words and hung up on her because I thought it was ridiculous and she called me back again and she said turn on the news turn on your tv it's it's everywhere tonight our metropolitan area and the whole world mourns the death of 43 year old movie actress natalie wood miss wood won the hearts and minds of fans of the silver screen everywhere and i still didn't believe her and i turned on the tv and i couldn't believe it i i couldn't believe it even then it's impossible it's impossible for someone like Natalie was to be gone absolutely should not happen. Mm. She was too much to too many people. There were two theories that persist, and we know that that's not what you think. They are that she heard a dinghy banging against the outside of the Splendor, went to investigate, fell overboard, or that Natalie and, and Robert Wagner got into some kind of argument and somehow she wound up in the Pacific Ocean. But, you know, there was that other theory too. I think what Robert Wagner said something about, oh, she got into the boat and she went off to party. And as you said, in a down coat and wool socks. And a nightgown. 
Yeah. When Natalie wouldn't go pick up her own mail without being fully made up and dressed in matching wonderful outfits, always, always. It didn't matter what we did. I would be in jeans and a t-shirt and Natalie would be dressed to the teeth, you know. Um, <laughs> it was just the most ludicrous thing that RJ has ever said about this. I mean, just absolutely ridiculous. No, the only thing that was um, still questioned, and I do mean only thing that was questioned, is was she unconscious or dead or still alive when she went into the water? Um, she oddly, the, the coroner found an unusual amount of urine that doesn't make any sense of someone hitting cold water if they were not passed out. Um, she would have had to have been completely awake and aware if she had been thrown into icy cold water at that time. Um, and she would have voided her uh, bladder. Um, yeah, Dennis, the ship's captain, told me a great deal. He told me many years before my writing that, that um, Natalie and RJ had been fighting, what they were fighting about, how they were fighting. And he said she was on the back deck by the swim step back there with RJ and that they were arguing loudly. And then, um, and he he had looked in on them once, he had tried to knock on the door because they were arguing in the stateroom as well. And he said he pounded on the door and said, RJ, is everything all right? Is there? Because he said it sounded like furniture being thrown around. It was like, it was very, very um, noisy in their stateroom. And he said that RJ opened the door a crack and said, Dennis, everything's fine. And slammed the door again. And he said, RJ looked disheveled and seemed very angry. Um, then he saw the two of them on the back of the boat. And he decided he would go there. And he went up a couple of stairs, get on uh, the side of the boat and walk back. And by the time he got there, it was only RJ standing there but he saw the both of them. Mm -hmm. So then he said to RJ, where's Natalie? And RJ said, she's gone. I can't find her. We've got to search the Splendor. Um, it's only a 65 foot boat. It's not that big. So, you know, Dennis said he went off and started searching. The staterooms in the front, Christopher was sound asleep in his room. Um, RJ searched the other side and then they came together and RJ said, she's gone, she's gone. And started pouring himself another drink and then poured one from Dennis and said, for Dennis and said, here, have this. And Dennis said that the two of them stood there drinking for quite a long time. And he kept saying, do you want me to turn on the searchlights? And RJ said, no, do not turn on any lights. And then Dennis said, shouldn't I call Harbor Patrol? Shouldn't I call somebody? And he said, no, it will bring horrible bad publicity. There will be reporters all over. No, no, no. You can't. He, he said, no, you can't. You can't do that. So they sat there even longer. And finally, you know, hours later, RJ went to make a phone call. And the first call he made was to his attorney, Paul Ziffrin. The second call he made was to Baywatch. So, um, not good. Has Christopher Walken said anything? He was on the Splendor of Well, of course. Has he said anything about this, Lana, to you or to anybody that you're aware of? Nothing. Nothing. And uh, when RJ and Christopher were flown off of the island back to the mainland, um, they were never separated. And they never separated Dennis from RJ and Christopher. They were all together 
until RJ said, Dennis, you're going to have to identify the body. So he wouldn't go and identify Natalie. Dennis had to do it. Um, then they were helicoptered off and still never separated. And the they you have to time, you have to write down the time on a log when you take somebody into the interrogation room. Then you write down the time when you leave. RJ was in the interrogation room for a little under five minutes. You know, if that happened today, you realize this would be quite different, an outcome quite different. Um, it also, the time that they spent together before the, uh, the detectives and got themselves all pulled together, RJ had time to tell everybody what to say. It would just be easier. Just say this. It's easier. There'll be no problems. Just, you know, because we don't know. We, we don't know what happened. So just say this. Did he ever call you, Lana, when the news broke and to offer some condolence or sense of understanding as to what had gone on? He never called me. I had to hear from my girlfriend and from the news on TV. I was also my mother was absolutely hysterical, but it destroyed whatever was left of my mom's life completely. You know, you think about the investigation uh, into her death. It's been open and active, then it's been shut, yep. then it's been reopened, yep. and then it's kind of been put on hold. And all the while, I can only think of those who really, truly loved her sister like you did. Yeah. The torment yeah. and the heartache and the pain and the agony <laughs> that must bring. At the time, I was working for uh, Ron Samuel's production. I was his uh, director of development. And um, he instantly called, and he and uh, Linda Carter, who he was married to at the time, um, instantly said, you know, we'll, we'll come over, we'll do, we'll take you. We'll. I mean, they were really lovely, but... Do I don't you, know. You must feel her around you. She must be there. There must be occasions where she's almost guiding you or wanting to send you a message. I mean, do clocks stop? Do weird things happen like that? Clocks. That's that's interesting that you said that. Dennis took home a clock of Natalie's. He was going to fix it and return it to her. And he never did. He never got around to fixing it. And it sat there. But he said when he got home at the time, the next day at the time that Natalie was missing, that clock started working. It started ticking away and working. Yeah, I'm I'm sure Natalie was around and I can only imagine how she felt. Um, you know, Robert Wagner had me blacklisted. I couldn't get a job because I had spoken out against him. And um, I was going on all these these different meetings because I had produced a special for Linda Carter. Um, I had um, co-produced a film for television with Linda. I had a great background and a good track record. And I would go to see people I knew and never got hired. And I thought, this is very, very odd. And um, one day, not thinking about anything, it was the afternoon, I got a call from then a very prestigious agent at ICM that used to be my agent, um, Roland Perkins. And he called me and he said, Lana, I've got something that I need to tell you. And I'm only telling you this because I like you and I think you're a good person. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, um, RJ's blacklisted you. He said, you can forget about trying to get a production job because nobody's going to hire you and you won't get an acting job either. So you are saying, by virtue of you being very public about what happened to your sister, that Robert Wagner, RJ, had you blacklisted in Hollywood. What in the hell did you do? Well, I had a daughter and three grandchildren that 
I was taking care of monetarily and emotionally. And it, you know what I did? I thought, no, well, this is ridiculous. I went and got a job at Barney's. I was I was managing the uh, the men's department at Barney's, and um, I would get a paycheck every week. And I would think to myself, "Yeah, couldn't get me, RJ. I'm okay. I'm working. My kids are okay. My grandkids are. Everybody's okay. You couldn't do it to me." I worked at a furniture store, and um, I worked for Sprint. Um, it was incredible, and all I wanted to do was produce films. But Look, Little Sister, yeah. your most recent book, you reveal yeah. an array of things that people just, uh, would I know, would have great difficulty getting their head around. Like Natalie told you the reason that she and RJ broke up the first time was because she walked in on them uh, and oh. he was in bed with the butler. Yeah. When she remarried him, you had this foreboding, didn't you, Lana, that, after what had happened that first time in that awful betrayal, uh, you just felt that something not good was going to happen and you didn't want her to marry R no. R Robert Wagner. I didn't. Ever. And I made it very clear, which did not um, help my relationship with RJ at all, and I know that. But, yeah, she started to go in the kitchen and I followed her on the evening that she announced that she and RJ were going to get married again. Um, and I said to her, what? what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What are you doing? And she said, you know, the old quote, sometimes it's better to be with the devil you know than the devil you don't. I mean, it's not surprising that RJ never really cared for me. I mean, we were nice to each other. We were I was at the house all the time and everything, but it was to be with Natalie and it would be Natalie and I doing something or going somewhere or leaving for a movie or, you know, hanging around because we she was going to have people over later and we were going to have dinner there. It wasn't with RJ. So part of his reaction is certainly understandable because I never um, I never tried to make a friend of him. The other bombshell in your book is that your 16-year-old sister, Natalie, uh, was sexually abused, raped by Kirk Douglas. Yeah. I remember Shirley MacLaine saying at one of those award shows where uh, Kirk Douglas was being honoured, why are we honouring a rapist? There are a number of people who feel that they're above the law and that they can feed their little different tastes, quirks, whatever you want to kindly say. I mean, there are, you know, there are all kinds of things going on and everybody gets away with it because they're influential. They have a great deal of money. They have stardom and they have um, contacts beyond that that always take care of them. So yeah, I was a I was a little kid, and uh, who went to sleep in the back of my mom's car because my mom was driving Natalie to this important meeting with Kirk Douglas because he might offer her a role, and it was at the 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 Beverly Hills Hotel, and we parked on a side street under a lamp because my mom was always nervous. And waited for Natalie and waited and waited. And as I said, I was asleep in the back seat. When Natalie came to the car, my mom and her said something, woke me up. Um, Natalie went around, got in the car, and they continued to talk in a very upsetting manner. Natalie was obviously very upset. She seemed out of sorts and rather disheveled when she had gone in. She looked like you know, a Barbie doll. I mean, she was perfection. Um, so, yeah, that was that. And then Natalie, Natalie told me one time sitting at her bar when it was just the two of us at her house that it was him that raped her. She said, he hurt me, is what she said to me. That's her quote, he hurt me. Mm. 
There's another <laughs> astounding revelation too, in that she was writing her memoir, committing her life to the pages. Of course, a life cut far too short and she never got to finish it. But you've been able to read that because the manuscript turned up somewhere. A woman who was a nurse in a doctor's office, um, he was closing his his work. He was retiring. And he had said to her, all these medical journals and everything in magazines, just load them up, throw them out. And she said, well, could I keep them? And he said, do whatever you want with them. She put them in her garage. And then years later, her husband got annoyed with her and said, would you please go through and get rid of all of those magazines and journals? So she said yes and begrudgingly went in to look through things. And she would pick up magazines and look to make sure it wasn't something that she wanted or didn't want. And she picked up one and found Natalie's manuscript in the pages in the of the magazine. Um, she then didn't know what to do with them. She they were mostly handwritten. Uh, there were some typed pages, but she called me. I didn't I didn't know who was calling me. Um, she actually, she contacted me first online and I gave her my phone number and she called and I said, well, I'm going to come over and look at them. So, uh, I drove forever to a little, um, trailer park. I just wanted to look at the manuscript, which she gave to me. And I looked through it in a very offhanded way. I didn't go into it because I was afraid to, but I looked at all the handwritten pages and it's Natalie's handwriting. It was Natalie's. And the way she said things and who she spoke about, it was Natalie's. So, um, you know, this lovely lady said, you know, what are you going to do with it? And I said, I have no idea right now. Um, I wanted to take it home and read it, which is what I did. And um, then some of the pages leaked. And um, the suddenly, uh, well, it was actually, it was Natasha, her daughter, who, when she wrote her last book, put those pages in her book saying they've never been seen. They were everywhere. So, no, they weren't given to her. They were given to me. I have a little note from this lady saying, you know, should I ever get any sell this and get any money for it that I owed half to her. And it was notarized and this and that. And her son was there to sign it as well. And um, yeah, it was very re revealing. It was very revealing. And Natalie wrote beautifully, beautifully. Um, it was very sad. I read a sad memoir about someone who never completely knew who she was because she was an actress all her life since the age of four. She takes on these personas and that's who she is. And then she comes home and she has to practice to be the next. And she just never really was able to be just Natalie. Just, you know, just Natalie. I have to say, you are tireless. Your determination to to tell the truth, uh, and 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 I guess just to keep the memory of your sister alive and with yes. honor and dignity is just mm -hmm. extraordinary. You're one heck of a person, Lana Wood, and also it's so great to see you looking so well because uh, you, you oh. referenced your daughter's death, Evan. 2017 um, was the year from hell for you and your family, wasn't it? And it was capped yep. off by her passing a shocking battle mm -hmm. with cancer. I, I can't mm -hmm. even begin to imagine your heartbreak, how how yeah. a mum deals with something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was uh, there again, uh, another terrible blow for the family. For Evan's kids, ugh, uh, they still have not recovered and I don't know when they will, if ever, you know, I, I don't believe it. Oh, well, you know, closure, it's nonsense. Yeah. But you know what, Lana Wood, you are one hell of a trooper. 
because you still work. Mercifully, that blacklist is no longer <laughs> there or it's been diluted. Yeah. Because well, the working. independent filmmakers who know me don't care. So I've been able to do some wonderful, fun things. And it's, it's well, been you so have. good. I yeah. want to point out Dog Boy, which is a movie now on Apple Plus that you made yes. with the, the wonderful Eric Roberts. Now, this is a movie, Lana, that almost is kind of like holding a mirror up to your life, isn't it? You know, this this wonderful movie star who was glamorous, who has then gone through these terrible hardships. But however the hell she does it, she just keeps on keeping on. I guess it is. <laughs> it is a little bit. Did you enjoy making that movie with Eric? Eric is divine. He really is such a caring, honest very, very giving actor, as a, he, a person. He was just terrific. He and his wife were both on the set, and they were just lovely. And they brought homemade cookies, and who can resist that? <laughs> so what's in the future for you, Lana? I know you've got a couple of other movie projects lined up that maybe you can't talk about, but what is what is ahead for you as you see it? You know what? I don't know, and I think that's the best part. I think that's okay because, as I say, I, I, there's one filmmaker, DJ Perry, um, who has who I've done four films for. So he keeps calling me back, and even if it's only you know a three day role in something, um, I I I do it because he called me very first and said, "Will you do this film?" And I was delighted. So you never know. Phones ring, somebody that I did a Western for, um, they called me not too long ago and said that they they think they're going to do a sequel. And would I be interested? And I said, absolutely. So you don't know. I don't know. And it's great. <laughs> it's well, okay yeah, I guess know. it's nice to have some surprises still in life, isn't it? I want to thank you for yeah. your kindness, your generosity <sighs> with time, being so candid and for just being you. You're one hell of a person. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.